So a few years back, my daughter wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, Dad, I had a nightmare. I said, well, Sienna, what was the nightmare? She said, I don't want to talk about it. And I said something important. I said, Sienna, we have to talk about this because we're not going to let this, the enemy get a spirit of fear in your heart. It's really important to talk about those things that you're, when your kids make you aware of something that scares them, this is your opportunity to help bring faith and dispel the spirit of fear. So we start talking through this, and I said, what happened? She said, well, we were outside, and you were out there with us, and we were playing outside in the front yard, and all of a sudden, this dragon comes and is flying around the neighborhood. You told us to go inside, and Dad, we listened the first time. I love, love that. I love that dream. Like, that's good. Thank you, Jesus. She runs inside the house, and she says, you were there with four guys from the church. And she lists the names of these, of these men, and they were all in their mid-20s, and they were part of a discipleship group I was leading. She said, you were there, and you stood, you stood in front of the house, and you pulled out swords to fight the dragon. The dragon came and it tried to attack one of them and, and it bit his arm and you guys tried to fend off the dragon. Well, all of a sudden the dragon comes and it lands on, your on our house and starts to crush the house and you didn't know what to do. But don't worry, Dad. Jesus came with a sword and killed the dragon. I said, Jesus? Yeah, I saw him. I was like, did you see his face? Oh, yeah. He's a great looking guy, Dad. <laughs> so there's Jesus, right? She says, if Jesus killed the, soul, killed the dragon, comes down and went inside the house and we had a party and we ate cake. It's like, that's the best Jesus dream. Aren't you glad that we explored that dream? I said, Sienna, this is what we call a prophetic dream. God is speaking to you. Let me just let you know, church. God speaks to your kids. Listen to your kids. Listen. The spirit of revelation. Praises ordained out of the mouth of children, Psalm says. So we take this dream as a directive from the Lord. Okay, God, where's the dragon? Let us pray. I share it with the four guys that are in my discipleship group. One guy named Michael says, this is a dream of the Lord. I said, okay. He's like, we're going to pray and fast about this dream. So Michael starts praying. He comes to me a week later and says, Pastor Brandon, we're going to pray and fast for seven days. I said, awesome. He's, I said, what does that look like? He says, it looks like me moving into your house. I'm going to pray from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in your living room and sleep in the living room. <laughs> How do you turn that down? Like, you most unspiritual pastor ever. No, I don't think that's the word of the Lord. <laughs> so I said, in my house. He said, in your house. I said, okay. And from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. every day, Michael worshiped and prayed his brains out. I remember being with Sean. Sean was at a meeting because we, we're out of our living room now, and there's Michael just screaming and yelling. Michael does not have the gift of worship leading. Let's just say that. But he is worshiping the Lord with all of his heart. And I'm trying to have these meetings. I'm like, this is, this is a move of God. Well, as we're praying through, Michael witnesses what I already knew. And I, the house across the street was a drug trafficking house. And so Michael says, that's the dragon. I said, well, it might be some of the dragon. He says, we need to pray that Jesus removes that house from this neighborhood. And I had witnessed to these men. I had called the police multiple times. No success. I mean, literally, we're seeing bag, duffel bags dropped off in front and picked up by other cars. Like, there's a lot of, of issues going on. I take pictures. And so we start praying. And Michael starts specifically praying for this house. Well, one day, I remember that night specifically, he says, And Lord, we, we declare that this will be a house of prayer for your name. And I thought, and as you hear something absurd, you're like, I'm like, that's the most unrealistic prayer, Michael. Like, how is that going to happen? I'm praying for these guys to get saved, but the likelihood is zero. Well, we finish the seven days of prayer and fasting. We end with cake, because that's what the dream had, right? <laughs> and so we finish. A week later, I get a call from an unlisted number. It's a detective. He said, we've heard your complaints. We just want you to know. We've been under, we have the house under investigation. Expect changes quickly. Now, I had done so much work. One week of prayer and fasting shifted everything. So out of nowhere, I get a call and they say, it's going down. I go home and there are helicopters and unmarked vans that come in and seize six felons out of that house. Completely shut down. So again, the house is now listed for rent. I mean, they shut it down. There's lots of issues going on. Well, my, <laughs> my babysitter comes over, says, is the house across the street for rent? I said, yeah. She's like, I would love to rent that one day. I'm like, no, Roseville rent is so expensive. There's no shot. She's like, no, I can get some girls together and we can rent it. I'm like, it's worth it. It's worth a shot. Goes, they sweet talk the landlord. They rent the place out to them. What does it become? A house of prayer. God 
God hears those absurd declarations we make and makes the impossible probable. That's what he does. And what we have in Joshua chapter 6 is one of the most triumphant victories in all of the Old Testament. It's a significant landmark of faith. But here's what we have to understand. There was a process to get there. Joshua 6 didn't just happen. We see there's this progression of transformation that Yahweh leads in the people of Israel to be able to take on a moment like that. And I really believe as we talk about taking ground, there are Jericho walls that you've been staring at for a long time. And you've been hoping that they come down. You've tried to scale the wall. You tried to chisel the wall. But there's one thing that moves that wall, and that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I really want us to enter in a place of faith today and ask the Lord to identify what those Jericho's walls are and what his plan is to take them down. That's the key. Do me a favor. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll continue on. We're going to go over a couple different chapters here very quickly. So Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. This is where the journey begins. Now, Joshua 1, it starts unlike any of the other Old Testament books. This is what it says. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving you to the people of Israel. See, we love singing the songs about the God of love, the God of comfort, the God of kindness. The one we tend to avoid is the God of truth. And here's what we see. Yahweh brings a fresh dose of reality to Joshua. Now, we understand that God is a God of comfort. He's a God of consolation. But truth and love is still truth, and truth can hurt. And what we notice is we have Moses, the miracle worker, the one that delivered them from Egypt, the one that led them up to the cusp of promise, but could not get them there. God calls Joshua to fulfill that promise. Now think about Joshua's journey. He helps lead the people out with Moses. He sits and watches the presence of Yahweh with Moses. They get up to the brink and then they fail for 40 years. He's seen the fruit of the promised land. He's touched the ground. He's tasted and seen, but he's never entered in. And he thought Moses was the one to get them there, but it was really Joshua. He's now in his older years. Let me tell you, church, some of you here may think that your season's done. Joshua's probably 70 around this time. A lot of you here are thinking retirement. You're thinking social security. The Lord has a different plan. Am I right, Bud Browning and Fred Saxelby? The Lord has a different plan of not retirement, but you're called to take ground until that day you go and meet the Lord on the other side. And as he stands there, he says, okay, Lord, what do I do? He says, arise. He tells him to get up. Just like in the movie Bambi, get up. <laughs> Stand up. And he uses that word arise, and I love that. In the Greek, if you translate, it's the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead and let Christ shine on you. See, I understand that 2020 and 2021 were tough. Trust me, I know they were hard. I saw households fall apart. I saw people get sick, people move away, lose everything. And the Lord understands the pain you've gone through. But 2020 and 2021 are over. Arise, get up, take land. Moses is dead, move on. We, we're not talking about stuffing grief. That's not what we're talking about. See, processing those things are very important. That's the power of community. That's what Mark's done. Mark and Debbie done. When you have community, it alleviates all those things. We've lived in a senior pastor model for so many years where everything is focused on this person with the microphone and the lights. That's not community. That's a moment. You need community to be able to process and communicate all that God's doing in your life and all the anxiety you have. That's where that shared growth and, and really breakthrough comes. And so from this, as we process 2020 21, the Lord says, arise, awake, O sleeper, and it's time to let some things go. See, in order for you to move into promised land, you can't continue on with the things you're carrying. How many here have overpacking syndrome? Anybody with me? Overpacking syndrome? You're the person with six bags, not one, when it's time for vacation. See, you can't enter the promised land if you look like this. Do we have that picture? That's not a way to get to the promised land. It's not going to work. And we're not talking about stuffing 
but shedding the baggage. One of my favorite verses, one of my favorite verses my buddy pointed out to me is when Saul is called to leadership, they say, where is Saul? And it says, Saul was hiding amongst the baggage. See, a lot of us are hiding in the baggage, and the Lord wants to peel those things off. Philippians 3 says this, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining toward what lies ahead, I press on towards the prize, the upward call in Christ Jesus. We have to let some things go. Because in order for you to let things go, you have to make room for what God wants to equip you with. Joshua 1.9 have I not commanded you be strong and courageous, not to be afraid? Do not be dismayed, because I will be with you wherever you go. Now, the word courage is not used very much in the Bible. It's a powerful term. And courage is a Latin word, as we translate it. It literally means heart and valor put together. Isn't that rad? And this is what courage literally means. It says to meet danger and trouble without fear. Not to avoid it, not to ignore it. To meet it, you have a date with danger, is what courage says. But you're not afraid. And in order for you to take on the journey ahead, you need to make room for courage. Courage takes space. You need to get to the gym of courage. Come on, people. We talk about that. Get to the gym of courage and let your heart be strengthened. See, God has a plan. And how many planners are out there? You're really good at making plans. But his ways aren't your ways. His thoughts aren't your thoughts, right? And one thing that God says is, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, right? We know that very famous verse is on every graduation card imaginable. But here's the thing. He says he knows the plans. He never told you that he would tell you what would happen in the plan. You, you catch that? He said he knows the plans. He did not say that he would tell you the plan. And what he does is if he invites us to this place of promise, he invites us to see the promised land, and we think that it's this very straight path, that it's rainbows and unicorns. Right, Natalie, at the end? <laughs> rainbows and unicorns. But this is what actually happens. The pathway looks a lot more like this. And here's the beauty of God. He doesn't tell us how it's going to go because we would never say yes. He won't tell you. Because we would never, you think I would sign up for senior, if Sean, would we sign up for this? No, we would not sign up for this. No way. No way. But we know the prize, this is what Paul says, is Jesus. Some of us need to reorient our definition of success, what the end game is, because those will always fall short. When your end game is Jesus, you always win. Always win. And so he says, I want you to make room for courage. And so what does he do? That courage starts to spread. He gets two more spies and says, I want you to go into Jericho. They spy out the land. We have the story of Rahab in Joshua chapter 2. Joshua 3 then takes a turn. Yahweh speaks directly to him. Think about the positional change. And I really want to encourage you here. When you're about to take ground, the Holy Spirit starts to speak very clearly. You just have to make room for him to listen, for you to listen and hear the voice. So he makes room. He starts hearing. He says, I want you to go and prepare the people. Prepare the people. They have to follow the ark. So what happens is they go around. All the commanders go and say, watch for the ark of the covenant. Watch for the ark. Follow the ark because you've never been this way before. You have to keep your distance and follow the ark. Very interesting. Now, the ark of the covenant is a symbol of what? It's a symbol of the presence of Yahweh. Inside the ark, we have that picture of the ark. Inside the ark... We have the jar of manna, we have the Ten Commandments, and we have the rod of Aaron. Significant miracles that have happened. And here's this symbol of the presence of Yahweh. It's unlike any other cultural religion. It's not an idol they worship. It's literally the symbol, and they believe that God's presence walks with them. So here's what the commanders say. They say, watch for the ark, follow the ark. Let me tell you this. You've never been this way before, they say. See, the path of promise is a land that you've not been to before. And the only way to get there is if you follow the Holy Spirit's leading. See, I've seen a lot of people these last couple of years make a lot of decisions where they make decisions without God. We've seen that, right? They make decisions where they consult God. God isn't looking for your consultation. God, what do you think about this? God's not speaking to me right now about this thing. Why do you think he's not speaking? It's not his plan. See, he's not looking just for a casual relationship. He's looking for lordship. 
It means he's the one making the plan and you're following it. Well, God hasn't spoken the plan. Then you know what you do? You get to wait. You get to wait until God speaks. Because a lot of us try to forge paths that we can't get to because God hasn't moved yet. There's paths that have been, un I get this picture of you entering the jungle and you're just hacking in the wilderness and you're hacking away. The Lord says, stop, let me clear the path for you. But God's time isn't your time. And those that deal with impatience, anybody else out there, any other type A's out there? The Lord says, slow your roll. He says, calm down, wait for me to move. And he says, watch the ark. And as these priests carry the ark, he says, the moment they enter the water, the moment the ark touches the water, the waters roll back. And they split the Jordan. Now, there's no way to cross the Jordan without this happening. It's a genuine miracle. And it says this, then the presence of God is there. The ark comes and they stand in the middle of the dry ground and they wait for everyone to pass. I love the symbolism where the presence of God is in the middle of the miracle. The presence is at the center and they don't move until the presence makes room in the path. For a lot of us here, the promise is ahead and you're trying to forge your pathway. You have to wait for the presence. The waters are too deep for you to survive unless the presence is guiding your way and splitting those waters in two. It's just true. A lot of you see that, that chasm or that river between you and that promise and you're trying to swim away. But let me tell you this, you may survive, but your family might not. And until the presence splits the path, you won't get across. We're really good at forging paths for God. Have you noticed that? We're really good at telling God how to get to a certain destination. Here's the problem. He's the one that makes the maps. And he's the one that made all this stuff. I remember I lived in an apartment right behind Best Buy by the Galleria. And there was a brand new path put into place. I mean, brand new road that connected to the Miner's Ravine. Anybody on the Miner's Ravine before? I know Patty drives on that Miner's Ravine. I've seen her on that bike. She goes. So the Miner's Ravine, beautiful trail that we have here right in the middle of Roseville. Well, this path would connect me to it. I no longer had to like run down Galleria to get to the Miner's Ravine. Well, a month goes by, two months goes by. The, the, there's still like yellow tape, caution tape. That you can't go on this path. Well, one day I said, forget it. I'm running on this path. So I go, I cross over the tape. You know that, that feeling of freedom when you're doing something bad? You're like looking around like, arrest me, you know, right? <laughs> so I start running down this path. I'm enjoying this freedom. I'm doing the wrong thing as an adult. And finally, I get to where the Miner's Ravine starts to meet over on Harding. And there's this giant fence, this gate that's locked and I can't get through. I'm so stubborn. Anybody with me? I'm so stubborn. I'm like, I'm getting over this fence. But there's barbed wire on top, so I can't do that. So I convince my brain that I can squeeze through the fence. That's a bad idea. Now, my body composition was a little different back then, but still it was absurd. And so I see this fence opening with this chain. I step over the chain. I'm like, I got this if I squeeze through. And I squeeze through and I push and there's resistance. I'm like, I make it through and I go in and the chain locks in my breastbone right here in my chest. And I'm stuck and I can't breathe. And I feel like I can go backwards and get out, but I'm so stubborn, I'm like, I'm gonna push through. And I push through and I break three ribs. And I scream, I'm like, ah, I'm over on the side of the road, right? I hear them pop, I hear them crack. I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Now I have to get home and I can't go back that way. So I still think in my head that I can run it off. So I'm running and I'm limping like this, down Galleria now by the mall. These three punk kids, in their car, open the window and say, run, Forrest, run. <laughs> oh, man. Some doors are meant to be open, but they're meant to be open by the Lord, not you. The path wasn't ready yet. It wasn't until the ark of the presence entered the water that they could get across. Stop trying to get ahead of God. So what happens? The Jordan splits. Joshua 5, it says, all the kings of the Amorites and Canaanites were terrified. They hear of the miracle. See, they weren't afraid. They had the waters that separated them. But now the waters are split in two. The miracle happens. And this is what I love. The hearts, it says their hearts literally melted. Did you know when you declare the wonders of God, the enemy gets afraid? 
Think about this. As fear affects us, faith affects them. It's the opposite ecosystem, right? They feast off of fear. We feast off of faith. And when you le release the wonders of God and faith and declare, the enemy is given eviction notice of what's going to happen. That no longer is he going to have power or jurisdiction in your life or your family's life. This is the discipline of rejoicing. As Paul says in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. What does that mean? It literally means to rejoy or to rejoin with the wonders that God has done. See, your worship has power. Your worship is a weapon. And they begin to declare the goodness of God and the hearts of everybody melts. Now, conveniently, when you have this story, if you're going through this book and systematic preaching, everybody skips to Joshua chapter 6 from here. Why do they skip? Because of this next passage. Verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised all the males of the people who came out of Egypt. All the men of war had, capture this, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Now, circumcision is one of the most avoided subjects in modern preaching. It's very rare that you have a circumcision series in a preaching time. <laughs> so we've chosen to not show pictures this morning. <laughs> but I do have a video. So I'm just kidding. You guys freaked out. I got you for a minute. I got you. Lighten up. Lighten up. No circumcision videos today. Here's the deal. <laughs> Where do you go after this, Sean? <laughs> Is this irrecoverable? Paul talks about a circumcision of the heart. How about that transition right there? And here's something that's important to notice. Is that when you come out of the wilderness, the wilderness is painful. The wilderness is hard. Think about this. When you work in a farm or in the field, what happens? You get resilience. You get strength. Have you ever shook someone's hand who works in a field? They'll break your hand. So strong. But when you come out of the wilderness, you have strength, you have resilience, you have character. But your heart can become hard and calloused. And here's the deal. The Lord, in the circumcision of the heart, wants to remove the hardness but keep the strength. He wants to remove the callous but keep the character. And come out of a year like 2020, 2021, a lot of you are stronger because you didn't give up. But your hearts are hardened and you can't, be, you can't beat yourself up over that. But you do have to surrender to the Lord, allow him to soften your heart again. Circumcise your heart again. That's that salvation process. That's that recreation. Salvation just isn't a moment. It's a journey with God. And here's what happens. After the circumcision, it's such a, such a brutal thought. They name it Foreskin Hill. So gross, right? So, yeah, don't, don't vacation there in the summer. So, they have, they have a circumcision. But here's the, here's the key principle. This is why we ain't skipping over this passage. It says they took a time to rest and to heal. You have to make room for recovery. And it's true rest, genuine rest, not the artificial rest of culture. It's not just a Caribbean cruise for a week and you're all good. It is good, yes. <laughs> you have to invite the Lord into rest. And that word recreation literally means to recreate. Guys, rest is not a true weekend of binging on Netflix. That is not a weekend. John Gimroth, did you hear me? That's not a weekend. <laughs> Of rest. That's what I did. He was making fun of me, actually. So, Rest is, ask this question. This year, as you set these goals, Lord, what does recreation and restoration look like in my, in my heart, in my life? So you can heal and keep the strength and keep the character and keep the resilience. That's important. So after they rest and they heal, they prepare into Joshua 6. In Joshua 6, 1, the key verse says this. Jericho is shut up from the inside and the outside. The author here is writing a description. This is an impenetrable wall. This isn't coming down. And this is what the Lord says. He says, see, I have given the city into your hand. The Holy Spirit is giving us new eyes to see vision like God sees. Not in the natural, but the spiritual. On the outside, that's an impenetrable wall, but God sees a city given. To Joshua. 
He wants to give you spiritual eyes to see in new ways that we go up seated in Christ, right? Seated in heavenly places to see from a heavenly perspective. And so God gives them a plan. This plan is absurd. We've preached this so many times. We talked about this so many times. No one walks around a wall. Do you understand this? Here's a picture of what maybe Jericho looked like. All right, here we have the picture of Jericho. You have these two forged walls of the lower and the upper city. What's the most dangerous place to walk next to? A wall of a city you're about to seize. There are often warriors all around it. There are traps. They would pour hot oil. They would pour poison. You name it, arrows. And that's where God commands them to stand. And here's what's so unique. He puts armed warriors in front and the ark right in the middle. The presence of God is at the center of their journey. Did you capture that? The most important warriors would be in the middle because they were not in the front lines, but they would then come in and take over. And they say the most important part of our army is Yahweh's presence. The most important part of your household is Yahweh's presence. The most important part of a city is Yahweh's presence. And it's our responsibility now as temple bearers, temples of the Holy Spirit, to carry that presence wherever we go. And here's what's so funny. Next to this dangerous wall, next to the place you shouldn't stand, what does he equip the priests with? Ram's horns. What should you have? A, sh a sword and a shield. He gives them this, a symbol of song, a symbol of worship. Why? Because worship is a weapon. As they're standing and they're marching, they blow their trumpets. They sing their song. Here's the power of song. The power of modern worship is this. You will sing things you'll never say. Capture that? The beauty of worship in modern worship is this. I know there's lots of issues with modern worship. We will not get on that soapbox right now. You will sing things you would never say but your heart doesn't know the difference. You begin to declare things in song that brings transformation and change in the heart. I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I said, when heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss, <laughs> and my heart turns violently inside my chest. I don't have time to maintain the regrets when I think about the way you love me. I have never said that out loud at a devotional time or a prayer time, but boy, have I sung it. And there's a change, there's a shift. Even just think about what, what Eden led us through today. You break me in pieces, put me back together. You reintroduce me to your love. I mean, there was beauty done there that I, I would never have words to articulate in a prayer. But someone forged that path and sung that out that I can join in, and that song becomes my prayer as well. You will sing what you'll never say. And they walk around this wall on that last time, on that seventh day. Here's what's unique. On the day of rest, on the day of Sabbath, God brings victory. And Yahweh literally fights the battle for them. And as they shout, as they lift up a shout, the walls crumble down and God gives them a city. Here's the other thing that we don't talk about. How many wars have these warriors fought? Zero. They weren't equipped to fight. <laughs> they were as scared as everybody else. But Yahweh's presence directed them, led them, and ultimately gave them victory. We look at this story of taking ground, the price of promise, all these things. We have this miraculous story of Jericho. It's beautiful. But God led them a lot of ways. Joshua was about to give up. He said, get up. Joshua then led them, not knowing what to do. The ark splits the water. He then says, circumcise your warriors. They heal up, and God gives them a city through song. What's your Jericho? What's that wall that maybe you've tried to scale, you've tried to take down? It's time to invite the presence of God into that problem. Because I guarantee he's got solutions you haven't thought of. Last Saturday night, I had a dream. It was very significant. We were in our Bonita building, and it was, really felt like today. And we were worshiping our hearts out.
is filled with young people. As we sung, as we sang, as we shouted, there's one thing I noticed. This is not any implication on you, Ben, or Eden. I think you guys do great. Sam, everybody else. But when we were worshiping together, <laughs> this is one thing I noticed. I didn't recognize anybody in the band. The band didn't sound good, but no one cared. No one cared. We worshiped and we sang. And I thought to myself, no one cares that the band isn't great. Because God's presence is all that matters. And as we sang, as we continued to shout to the Lord, we sat down. Sean gets up to give announcements. As he's giving announcements, I hear what sounds like chatter in the back. And people are clapping their hands. I said, no, no, you got to be quiet. He's trying to speak. And then I realized it wasn't chatter. It was rain. And a downpour happened. And the rain increased and increased. It was so loud and so heavy, it broke the roof of Bonita. And as rain starts to flood in, we all step back. I go to the outside and we notice this flash flood breaks out. And this is the thought that comes to mind. I'm so glad we were in here together. Otherwise, we would have been swept away. Wake up from the dream, talk to Aaron the next day. I really feel like the Lord is taking our church into a season of seeking his presence. And he's going to pour out his spirit. A great rain will happen that will open that roof, that will open heaven, all while the flood of culture is happening. But the safest place is to be with his people, in his ecclesia, in his church. We will not be swept away by this flood. Yesterday, my buddy Gary texted me as well. He says, I had this dream. There was a small stream. They turned into a larger stream. They turned into a rushing river, as, as, as violent as a fire hydrant. God's bringing a move of the Spirit. I said, Gary, you have no idea the timing of that dream. God is bringing us into his presence, and that's the solution for the hour we stand in. So let's stand together as we pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for stories like Jericho. We thank you for examples like Joshua, when there was no solution, there was no answer. There was no way out other than your presence. Well, we recognize a lot of people here have a Jericho they're facing. They have a place of pain, a place of difficulty. Lord, we just surrender that Jericho to you right now. Just eyes closed. You see, you know what? I'm facing a problem I cannot solve on my own. I need God's help. Lift your hand up if that's you. Holy Spirit, we ask for your divine intervention. Give them the strategy. Give them the song and the word of the Lord that those walls would fall in due time. But Jesus, we command that your presence will be at the center. That we won't enter those waters until you say so. That God, we won't go our own way. We won't forge our own path. Holy Spirit, speak. I pray for a visitation of your presence upon your people. Right now, some of you here, when I said that word about the wilderness, you see, you know what? My heart's become hard. I recognize I've gone through some tough stuff. But my heart's become hard and I need the Holy Spirit to soften me. If that's you, wave your hand at me. Right now, Holy Spirit. Soften our hearts. I, I, we release and break the spirit of trauma in Jesus' name. Where there's been loss, there's been miscarriage, there's been pain, there's been betrayal. We say no more. Healing. Wash over them, Holy Spirit. Heal over them, Holy Spirit. Do the work that only you can. Heal in the way that only you can. God, bring rest. Bring freedom. Bring healing. God, we say yes to you and all you have in store.